So as chemists, one of the things we do a lot and that we spend a lot of time doing is making measurements, measurements on chemical samples. And we really have four broad reasons why we do that, four reasons for making those measurements. And the first is to determine what our compound is. We have a chemical sample and we might be a mixture of things, might be a, a single pure compound, and we want to identify what it is. And so we have identification things most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time we, we have an idea of what compound we're looking at. Very often we're trying to synthesize a particular compound and our goal is to see if we actually made the compound we wanted to make, in which case we're doing measurements to see if, we, if we've done that to, to kind of characterize that, that compound. Sometimes, if you're, say, for example, a forensic scientist, sometimes you'll just get a sample and you have no idea what it is. But that, that's, that's more often than, than not, not the case. The second thing that we use measurements for is to make measurements of the properties of a compound. So we know what the compound is, we know what the molecules are like, and what we do is we want to measure something about them. So for example, if you had this molecule here, you might want to, uh, the red atoms are oxygens and the white ones are, are hydrogens, you might want to measure the distance between those two atoms. Or you might want to measure the, the angle that these portions of the molecules are, are relative to one another. You might want to see if, if there's any evidence that that this part of this molecule, of the molecule comes and kind of gets this group near, gets near that group. And so we want, to, we want to analyze the properties of the compound that we've made. Sometimes it'll be a, a molecular scale thing like that. Sometimes it'll be a bulk scale thing like measuring the boiling point or the melting point or something like that. Sometimes we can um, use measurements then uh, to determine whether or not a chemical reaction is happening or not, to follow the course of a reaction. And we do that by taking a measurement over time and seeing for changes in that measurement. And then the last uh, reason that we really make measurements on things is simply to quantify, to make a quantification measurement for a compound that we know what the compound is, we know its properties, and what we really want to know is we know how much is there. And so an example of that, it's used a lot in industry, an example of that would be if you were Walgreens and you were making ibuprofen and you were making 200 milligram tablets, you'd want to make sure that the tablets in fact really had 200 milligrams of ibuprofen in them. And so there are a number of techniques that we have for making measurements of how much of a particular compound is present in a sample. And so and that's, the, that's the, um, the, the subject of our experiment today. And we're going to be measuring uh, samples that contain nickel ions in solution. There are a vast variety of different kinds of measurements that we make, a lot of different techniques we use, and many of them involve um, uh, impacting uh, your chemical sample with different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so one of those techniques is called infrared spectroscopy. And what you do is you shine infrared radiation on a compound and then see whether it gets absorbed or not. And what happens is when infrared light hits a uh, chemical compound for certain uh, ways that the molecule vibrates, it'll make the molecule vibrate at a higher energy level, make it vibrate more. And so it might make this bond all of a sudden start vibrating, or it might make these bonds get, get closer together. That's called a bending vibration. And that technique can be used for two things. It can sometimes be used to identify one compound versus another. So for example, it would be good at identifying this compound, which these two atoms here are crossing each other. That's called the trans um, isomer. Or the same kind of compound, same formula, but the two, these two atoms now next to each other. That's called the cis isomer. So infrared spectroscopy can be used for that. More often, though, it's used for identifying what are called functional groups. So for example, uh, an oxygen and hydrogen vibrating absorbs a particular wavelength of infrared light. And so if you see that wavelength being absorbed in your spectrum for your compound, it identifies that that, that compound has one of those groups. In addition, another group that's, that's uh, good for this is what's called a carbonyl group, which is an oxygen doubly bonded to a carbon. And that has a particular vibration where it absorbs a particular wavelength of infrared light. And the compound, if, it, if the compound you're looking at shows that uh, infrared absorption, that kind of says that you have that portion of the molecule for it. So that's what infrared light does. By the way, infrared, that does infrared uh, absorptions are what are responsible for the greenhouse effect happening with carbon dioxide and some other compounds in the, in the atmosphere. Another uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that's used is, is x-rays. X-rays are, um, are impacted, usually these are done on solid samples, and what happens is the x-rays will come in at a particular angle, and when the x-rays get near the nuclei and the electron clouds of the atoms in this crystalline uh, solid, they get diffracted, and they diffract at particular angles. And those angles have to do with the distance between layers of atoms in that crystalline solid. 
And by looking at the solid in different, different uh, angles, different layers, you can see all the different ways that the, like, the x-rays get diffracted. And from that, you can back calculate where all the atoms are and get the, the shape of that crystal. Another uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that's used indirectly actually is radio waves. Chemical compounds don't actually absorb radio waves very well on their own. But what happens is if you take a chemical compound, something like this, and you put it in a really strong magnetic field, then what happens is certain nuclei, including hydrogens and carbons, will absorb radio waves. And that's the basis for MRI imaging that you have happening in hospitals. And the chemical technique for that is called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, uh, nu nuclear, nuclear magnetic resonance. And what it does is it, it, it probes the kind of chemical environment for particular atoms in a compound, and it's the premier, the most important technique for used for figuring out shapes of organic compounds. So today's experiment is going to use the, the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum you're most uh, familiar with, and that's the UV visible uh, portions of the spectrum, in particular the visible portion of the spectrum, where the light that we use, that light that we see, that our eyes detect, is the visible portion of the spectrum, because that's what we use in vision. And the, near, um, the nearby uh, portion that's just a little higher energy is the ultraviolet uh, portion. And so we're going to be looking at the way that compounds absorb visible spectra, uh, visible uh, light, and use that as the basis for doing a quantification experiment, and that's what we're going to be doing today.